welcome back to Bible study to Paul's letter to Galatian Church, chapter 5. Welcome, back, John. Thank you. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Um, chapter 5, verse 5. Derek, you're going to read. Very us. good. Up to verse 12. Up to verse 12. I'll pray. For we, through the Spirit, eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach um, circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Thank you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, again, for your word, for the, the depth of passion of Paul. Thank you, Lord, for the truth that is coming through these uh, verses that we are taking care to, to cover. And Lord, we pray that you'll speak through our words and that all those who are tuning in this hour will hear from you, not from us. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so sort of last week, you know, we, we talked about circumcision not having value or, or, you know, Christ not having value if you're a circumcised. And then we got this verse 6, if I'm not jumping ahead, which I'm sure I am because I always do. It's saying that neither circumcision or uncircumcision has value yeah. in the context. We didn't quite finish verse 5, did we, last week? Yeah, I mean, he, that... He, he, he's talking on the issue of circumcision, but as we said, circumcision, from, from the point of view of, of the context in Galatia, is connected with the keeping of the whole law. And so he's, he's dead against them doing being circumcised because he knows that that's the, the, the outward sign that they are now committed to law-keeping to try and justify themselves. Mm. In, in obeying the teaching of these legalists. And he knows that that is the spiritual death trap, mm. you know, for their spiritual lives. Mm. And um, so now he is describing, he's beginning to describe now, and he'll do more in chapter 5, of what, what is the Christian life all about? Is it about doing these outward rituals? You know, is that being circumcised, not being... And he basically says it's not about these externals, really. not, not the basis of it, not the heart of it. There are things we do outwardly, obviously, but the basis of the Christian life is our relationship with the Lord. Mm. And so he, he's talking in these two verses, 5 and 6, first of all he's talking about the Spirit and Christ Jesus. It's all about our personal relationship mm. with Him. And he's talking about the big three, you know, faith, hope and love. Yeah. It, it's it's the just spiritual pick them out. dynamics. Yeah, just pick them out, so you know, faith, faith, hope and love in, in this uh, passage. Particularly faith. He yeah. talks about through the Spirit we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness, that right. for the hope so of righteousness. Hope, faith and love. And then by faith. Yep. And then he connects faith and love together in yep. the next verse. That's right. And the, he's saying, I'm talking about a faith that works through love. Yeah. And, and so he's saying, what really matters is faith, hope, and love. Yeah. It's, it's our relationship with God, who, who is spirit. Mm -hmm. And these, these outward thing of circumcision in, in themselves isn't, isn't important. Um, and so it's a wonderful description of, of the, the Christian life that we should enter into. Once we're justified by faith, yeah. we enter into a life of faith, mm -hmm. of reality, of the Holy Spirit. And, and the grace of God. And I love his description, for example, he says, through the Spirit, inter yeah. which is interesting, mm. it's through the work of the Spirit in us mm. that, that we, uh, well, he describes, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now, 
It, it's a life of faith, but the way he describes it is in terms of waiting. And, and we're talking, we did talk last time we about did. Right, that. Right at the end, I sort, of, I sort of shoehorned in yeah. a little bit of Romans 8, and John, you jumped up out of your seat <laughs> when we talked about the glory, the glory of God. Yeah. 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 And certainly the hope of righteousness, let's talk about the word hope first, elpis, is not like, oh, I hope it's going to be, re uh, it's going to be sunny tomorrow. Yeah. It's not wishing. It's a confident expectation mm -hmm. of what God's going to do uh, based on our faith. Yeah. And so, could I, could I throw in, because I read from Romans 8 la last week, but in Romans 5, I mean, it, we're talking about Galatians 5, but in Romans 5, you know, therefore, since you're justified by faith, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access in, uh, by faith faith into this grace in which we must stand. And, and then he says, and we rejoice mm. in the hope of the glory of God. Mm. So it's there as well. It's Sometimes sort of re-emphasizing. Because we're justified, we rejoice. Mm. John, come on. Um, I, I thought you were going to say something. No, no, no. I, I, I was just agreeing. I was yeah. agreeing with you. This hope, uh, this certainty, this yeah. uh, certain expectation yeah. is spot on. And it's important to stress that point because in the English language, it o often means more wishing, doesn't it? Yes. But that's exactly. not what it means no. in context at all. And, and also in that same passage, is, and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it, it hope is used in the sense of that which is hoped for. Yeah. So in that passage, it's the hope of the glory of God. Yeah. So that is what we're hoping for. That's what we have assurance, yeah. faith assurance, that we are, will be glorified. Mm. We have that hope based on our justification. And in here, it's talking about the hope of righteousness. Now, it's not that we're not righteous already, because by the imputed righteousness of Christ, we are righteous. But this is talking about a future righteousness that will be manifested. So mm -hmm. this is imparted righteousness. Now, we said last time, this certainly is fulfilled by our glorification. The hope of our perfected righteousness that we will eventually have. But I want to also say that it does describe also that part of our life of faith is that we eagerly wait for mm. the righteousness of Christ, because it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And this is his imputed righteousness. We call it love. I think it's pretty much the same thing, because love is the righteousness of God. Love is his righteous character being expressed in our life. It's lovely. And so... We desire that love of God, that righteousness of God, to be manifested in our character, in our life. And, and, but it's, notice it says we don't work for it, we wait for it. Because even in our sanctification, uh, it's not something we can do by our works. It's something that Christ does in us. Yes, as we cooperate with him, as we obey him, but it's essentially his work. He sanctifies us. And, and therefore, it's, it's the sitting posture, you know, sit, walk, stand. Mm. We are resting in and we are waiting with confident expectation that the Holy Spirit is producing his love, joy, peace, his righteousness in our lives. And, and we are, we are waiting, it's our faith rest position. We are trusting in him to sanctify us, to produce that hope. We have assurance that he's doing it. He is making us like Christ, and we rest in Him, and that, then our flesh gets quiet because we're, we've given up trying so to I, manufacture righteousness. I can hear ourselves. sort of echoes of uh, monasticism. You know, there is an element of it where they they're quiet before the Lord. You know, not you know, it's like a different way of life to the one that we, you know we're very Western and you know systematic. But there seems to be an element of resting in him. What's the difference, oh, John? Well, I, I mean, I, monasticism if, in the sense that they're shutting themselves away from the world and perhaps committing themselves. It's, it's not bad I, at all. But you, again, you're back to heart motive. Is, is, is your purpose to shut yourself away from all the distractions of the world and just commune with the Lord? Well, that's fine. 
um, what are you going to do? The Lord says, I want you to go out here now. I want you to throw off your monk's habit and do something else. Are you willing to do that or have you sold out to monasticism? It's, it's, all, it's back to obedience. There's nothing wrong with it in itself. Yeah. There's a lot to be said for taking time out, going away and shutting yourself and spending time with the Lord. Mm. In fact, those people, I, I know a, a number of people who've, who are not Roman Catholics, but they've gone to... Um, uh, monasteries or whatever because it's a lovely place to retreat. I've, I've been, went to one myself um, at uh, Dowie, you know, near Reading. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, if, they, if they don't talk, if there's silence you know, during the day or silence all day, if there's a silent order, that can be wonderful. You know, you just, you can't... You can reflect just, on yeah, and people God's have had work of grace in life. Tremendous experiences of Lord in that, of the Lord in that silence. So it's, it, it's neither one thing or the other. It's again, it's your heart, it's your relationship with the Lord. And if you want to spend a period of time away from the world in a sort of monastic environment, that's fine. Yeah. But if you're committing to it for life, I'm not saying it's wrong, mm. but it might be wrong. Yeah. It's again, it's all... It's not particularly it's, biblical, is it? No, just, it's not particularly biblical. No, I'm just sort of triggered by this idea of waiting. You know, and in prayer, we're yeah. always anxiously trying to do something. Yeah, you, you have to hold verse 5 and 6 together. Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, and the th and we, we talked about this before. We have to learn how to sit in the grace of God, we have to, which is the waiting part. Because this is acknowledging that ultimately God has to do it. But it's waiting with expectation and assurance that he is working. But notice, and it says, so by faith, we wait for the hope. All right, so, so faith creates, this faith rest that we enter into creates an assurance. And we're trusting in him to do it. But notice, also, it's faith working through love. Mm. In other words, it's a genuine saving faith where we're resting in the grace of God will, will be expressed naturally by love because our faith is connecting us to the source of love, to the fountain of love. The Holy Spirit is, is the fountain of life within us. So when we do rest and trust in Him, in yeah. Christ in us, it will issue forth in love if it's a genuine faith. If it's a genuine saving faith, we are now connected to love. Mm. And therefore, it will issue forth in love. So we won't be sitting around in a monastery, you know, yeah. doing nothing else. Not, that's, I'm not <laughs> attacking that. But I'm saying They're that quite it, industrious, funnily it, enough. It will issue forth in a life of love. Yes. And, and the, it, there will be obedience. There will, when you love God, you, you want to obey Him. You That's want right. to please Him. And, and that will be evidenced. Mm -hmm. uh, and so his description of the Christian life, it begins with waiting, trusting in the Holy Spirit, but it issues forth in love, in obedience. Because Jesus said, if you love me, obey my mm -hmm. commands. So obedience is the expression of our love for the Lord. It starts with the love. And, and the proof that we have that genuine faith is that it will show itself. Not that we'll be perfect, no. but that, that there will be signs of life. <laughs> Again, it's the outworking of the love which he's put within us. Exactly. Um, as, as uh, you know, it's, you know, the obedience is from faith, not sort of faith drummed up through, yes. your, through your obedience. We understand he's the source of righteousness. Yeah. So we wait for the hope of righteousness. We, we understand, we're waiting in him to produce that righteousness in yep. our life, but, but that righteousness will come, it will flow, and, and we need to obey and, and lit, walk that out. Um, it's faith that works through love. And he, and he says, that's the only thing that counts. Again, he's, he's very exclusive, isn't he? You know, you can't have circumcision and, yeah. and as it were, saving faith, you, 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 and you also, you can't, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. Exactly, you said this is a red herring at, at the very least, you know, yeah. you're getting into circumcision, all this, and, and he goes on and he says, you ran well, you know, mm. you were doing well, mm. you, you, were, you were walking in love, you yeah. know, you, you had this assurance of your salvation, mm. and, and you were walking 
in, and, and God's so this love is, is working seven. in your life. You know, you were running yeah. a good race. You ran well. Yeah. You, who hindered you from obeying the truth? And yeah. so the Christian, we're talking about sitting. Got to jump in, oh, John. Yeah, I will. Yeah. I will. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just quickly say <laughs> yeah, this. We, he's talking about s s sitting, resting, yeah. hope, waiting, trusting in Christ to do it through us, but at the same time, we walk it out. And notice how he defines running well. Yeah. It's obeying the truth. Mm. See, whenever we accept the truth of, of God's grace for us, and now we start living our life in line with that, we start obeying the truth. Every time we take, it's is like putting one, one foot in front of the next. We Steps of obedience, we're obeying God as he, as he works within us. And that's the Christian run. That's the Christian. I get, I get an impression when he talks about the race of famous races in the Olympics that I've seen, where yes, you're running in your lane, or let's say it's the 800 meters because you 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 you're not running in your lane. Um, you you they all sort of bunch up and then they after whatever 50 meters they all join that mm -hmm. lane. But you can be running your lane and then someone cuts in on yeah. you. Um, and they even use the term in the NIV. You know what? You were running a good race, and then Steve Overt sort of barged his way, elbowed yes. his way in in front, and then you're you're completely. You've lost your orientation. You've lost the lane. You know yeah. the end of the race. You're just you've you've lost the plot. There is that danger, isn't it? That someone else can come in and you can lose your focus. You know that. Um, it is, um, as it were, a justification by faith alone, uh, but someone comes in and um, upsets yeah. Your, yeah. your footing. Yeah. Yes, yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm intrigued that Paul, in this passage, particularly on circumcision, doesn't refer to circumcision of the heart, which is the replacement for the circumcision of the body. So there is a circumcision, but it's a spiritual circumcision, and it changes your stony heart to yeah. one that's soft and tender with the, the, with the law of God written upon it. Yeah. Uh, so you now obey the law out of love, not out of a legal obligation to do so. Yeah. It's quite different. Yeah. He doesn't refer to that. No, obviously, he wasn't inspired by the Holy Spirit to do so, so I can't criticize yeah. him. Yeah. But it's an interesting point, and it's also important for us to understand that our hearts have been circumcised. Yeah. They have in some way been cut by the Spirit of God uh, in such a way that, you know, seals our covenant relationship. And, and um, you, 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 you can only ever have one heart. <laughs> yeah. Well, even <laughs> forget the days yeah. of implants and yeah. but um, you can only but it is a work of God isn't it it's circumcision of the heart by the work spirit is really it's not something you can drum up no mm. it changes well, you it's part of the your identity as a new creation and most of us I think will have identified that we were different mm. something changed in us yeah. um, yes you can you can be as we we had the analogy of you know the yeah. seed falling on the wrong ground you know you can be on that race and and you it's good seed and you've you've had a good conversion yeah and you're on track and then someone knocks and then you, you off. hear a bit of bad teaching you hear a bit of bad teaching and you're thrown mm. uh, um, and there's no counterbalance and you get sucked in and that happens to lots of people doesn't yeah. it yeah. Um, but, you know, what's the point in circumcising the flesh if the heart's already been circumcised? It's redundant, yeah. mm. totally redundant. Good point. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. exactly. And of course, Paul is, is pointing to, he says, who is it? He wants them to, to think about yeah, this. Yeah. But of course, it's probably, it's this legalistic teacher, the, probably the leader of those teachers, mm. Mm. Um, who has, has broken their stride. Mm. And now they're not sure what, they've lost their balance. Yeah. And, and he says, this persuasion does not come from him who calls you. From the Lord. Yes. From the Lord. From the Lord. In yes. other words, this, the origin of this interruption in your spiritual life of legalism is not from God, although he claims to be from God. So it's satanic. And it relates to chapter 1, verse 7, which says, um, or is it verse 6? Mm. I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you yeah. in the grace of Christ yeah. to a different gospel. So he's saying it's God who called you into grace. And now this other one who's calling you out of grace, as it were, yeah. it can't be God. 
whoever it is, they are not speaking from God, yeah. he's saying, because God called you in grace. Yeah. And so if whoever's doing this to you is he, not from God because God doesn't contradict himself. Yeah, it's, again, there is no universalism with the gospel. There's no. just one, one way of salvation. That's right. There's one God, one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And, th and then he warns, well, uh, the, he warns that this, the, this thing is dangerous. A little leaven. Yes, he does. That's why he's, leavens he's so the whole strong. Lump. Exactly, yes. So that's in verse 9. Yes. Um, this is the yeah, why, why is Paul so passionate? Because he knows that one little, yeah. little chink in the armour and you're going to be flawed. This Another is, analogy. This is the danger of false teaching. Yeah. yeah. It, first of all, it could spread to the whole congregation, which yeah. it was doing. But also, it, you could think of it like this as well. It's like, well, what's the big deal, Paul? I'm mm. just talking about being circumcised, little yeah. operation. Yeah. Why are you making such a fuss about, you know, this? Well, there's no, no harm in it. But he realizes it's the thin end of a wedge. Okay. And if you open the door to the principle mm -hmm. of, you know, of circumcision, it represent what it represents, it's, it's going to lead Funnily to enough, legalism, it's exactly like blown legalism. sin. You know, just that little bit of sin. Mm. And, you know, and you take that, oh, it'd be harmless, just a little white lie, that's okay. And, you know, just, and then the devil just entices you with little things. Yeah. Um, I remember um, David Watson used to come to our school with a mission and, uh, from St. Michael's the Belfry in York. And, um, and they did a sketch, the sketch of the chocolate box. Do you remember that? No. Um, it was a great little mime of, um, of, this was Phil Potter and, you know, the, the a drama group. Um, you know, they start with, oh, they just have a little taste of the chocolate in the box, and then they have a bit more, and then a bit more, and before you know it, they're actually climbing into the box. <laughs> you know, they've been completely entrapped by it. And that was talking about sin. I don't think they were thinking about the law, but it's exactly the same, isn't yeah. it? Just a little bit, and then, oh, a bit more. Actually, we need to put a hedge around it. And before you know it, your whole life is consumed by observing the law. You've missed it. And that's what he's saying. If you if you just, if you in, get the circumcision, now you're finding yourself obliged. Yeah, yeah. To keep the whole law, and before you all know it, your whole life is about keeping all these different yeah. ordinances and commandments and a little, so a little yeast. <laughs> and it's interesting. Yeast is used in a good sense and a bad, isn't it? In the, in the scriptures. Yes. Yeah. You know, you can have a good effect. Um, as it were spread to the whole, but equally yeast can, mm. I think I'm right. Yes, you I are. can't remember where the reference is. No. But then you have, we were talking yeast about, is yeast. We were talking words. about it. The kingdom of heaven is like the woman who took the three lumps of dough and put a piece of leaven under each of them, that, which is the exact opposite of this. Yes, yes. <laughs> but it's yeast. Is, it, uh, yeah. That, yeah, Jesus it has would that also effect. told, beware the yeast of the yeah. Pharisees. Pharisees. It's used beware in the yeast both cases. Of the Herodians and, yeah. Yeah. But it's not, false teaching is not to be underestimated. No. no. It, it is dangerous and it, is, it spreads, you know. So w you have to have an uncompromising. I'm always thinking of the extreme, it. Where, it, where it leads, you know, with Waco, Texas or Jonesville. Yeah. yeah. You know, for, as you say, it's really deadly, dangerous. It's toxic through, that's why it talks about doctrines of demons. It, in other words, demons know that. It's effective, and it winds of doctrine. Talk, the Bible yeah. talks about winds yeah. of doctrine. In other words, spiritual forces are associated with different doctrines. Mm. It's either the Holy Spirit mm. with the true doctrine, or there are evil spirits associated with false doctrines. And therefore, it's very important that, that you, we stay close to the Bible, Definitely. and and guard ourselves against false doctrines because they release evil mm. forces in our life. If, if they're wrong, you know, and that's the yeast, you know, has this effect. Be on our so guard. Be on our guard. Be aware of the spiritual battle over this issue. Yeah, and, and the, the, the Lord places responsibility on the teachers, you know, you, you, you need to be very, make sure you're teaching what he says. Now, of mm. course we all make mistakes, yes. of course we're all deceived, but, you know, this is major doctrinal difference from the gospel. Mm. 
and uh, the Lord holds them accountable. If the, the shepherds who lead the flock astray, yeah. they're going to have to answer to him. Um, Lord's was very strong, the teachers of the law, you brood of vipers, yeah. you know, it's really strong. But it's interesting in verse 10, suddenly Paul gets more confident, you know, okay. that, that actually he, he, he hasn't really expressed this before, but he says, I have confidence in you, That's right. he breaks in the Lord, that you will have no other at mind. In other words, that you're going to come to your senses. He's, he's, yeah. he's confident that God's going to reach them. Yes, he is. God's more powerful than, yeah. than all this yeah. other stuff. Yeah. And, and so quite I, I love, I love verse that. Verse 10. Yeah. They're really refreshing. And I, I would, you know, just to, so as a figure of speech, I, I would estimate that 999 times out of a thousand, God does reach them. I think, you know, the ultimate of what could happen falling from your grace and, uh, falling from grace and losing salvation is so rare. Yeah. as to be statistically irrelevant, but it could happen. Um, but it's not something that happens very often. Yeah. And Paul, you know, is obviously putting a marker because he's yes. establishing good doctrine. He's got he, to he be forced. Because it's the sheep that have gone astray yeah. and the Lord goes and gets them. And, and he knows that and that's why he can write this verse. Yeah. I am confident. He doesn't want to the crush Lord. them, does he? No, no. With, with his the Lord will come and get you. It's really reassuring. So, of course, Galatians is written not just for the Galatians, it's for us. For us. It's, it's projected through church history, through all those who have access to read these writings. Um, so, of course, it's going to be an absolute epic, you know, the, these laying the foundations of good um, gospel doctrine, but he doesn't want to crush the poor blighters who were, who were the first recipients yeah. of it. And, and um, just another side to the confidence, I suppose, is that just, if you like, natural forces. The more you struggle in your own flesh, the more you're going to be unhappy in your life. You're going to be discouraged. You're going to keep failing. You know, yeah. and there's, at some point, you're going to wake up and say, this isn't working. Yeah. I need to reevaluate, you know, and come back to the Lord, because sometimes it's our failure that, that causes us to turn back to Christ, you know, and uh, so there's that too. He's a very caring pastor, isn't he? You know, he's like, like a, a loving father, mm. will, will correct, you know, and discipline um, his, his, his son. But, you know, you, you'll see at a point where, where if you overdo it, your son loses confidence and then you want to turn and change tack and, mm. and yes. build him up. But you don't want to build him up too high because he gets too proud. So, you, you know, you're, you're measuring what you're writing. I think Paul is a very caring, he's not an uncaring yes. no. teacher, is he? No. And he also, uh, the other side of it is, you know, God will judge the false teachers. Yeah. You know, but he, he who troubles you and, and uh, shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. Uh, and That's it. and it's basically saying, you know, the, God's going to deal with this false teacher. Yeah. You know, it's interesting the word, the one who troubles you, um, because in I think, um, oh, and he uses it again. I think in verse twelve, mm. that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Mm. Uh, it's used in Acts thirty twenty one thirty eight for those who stir up a rebellion. Wow. Uh, which is an interesting, um, so it's quite a strong word, you know. It, this person, Acts 21, that's 38, do you have it? it there? Yeah, but I, that's not, it's not 38. Oh, sorry. Because it's talking about, are you the Egyptian who started yes, a revolt? Yes, it is. It's it that is. one. Starting a revolt. That's right, you're right. Aren't you the Egyptian who started? So you stirred up a revolt. a revolt, it's the same word. Okay. So he, this tells you what these false teachers were doing. They were stirring them up to revolt against the grace of God and, and to revolt against the Apostle Paul. Mm. Um, you know, so, you know, they, what they are doing is, is really saying, you know, doing a serious thing and God's going to hold them to account. Yeah. Um, that it's, it's an absolute titanic struggle, isn't it? And Paul is, you know, he's obviously trying to win them back to the true path um, and they're, you know, they're running the race, but there's someone running here and saying, push, go that way, go that way. And, and, and so Paul, as it were, he's trying to encourage them, verse 10, but then he, you know, he's like throwing a punch at these other <laughs> characters who are trying to knock you off, off so that you know 
that they're false. You know that they are in error and that, well, it's, it's contemptible what they're doing and he, and he calls it out for what it is. And, and, yeah. Which is what we should do. Yeah. So again, we're, we're, we're obviously wanting to nurture and cherish those who are of the faith, but we've got to absolutely not in any way hold back in denouncing things that are wrong. Mm. Mm. Difficult balance. Very difficult. Yeah. yeah. A lot of wisdom. And, and verse 11 is another tactic that obviously some of them were using, which seems strange. But anyway, he says, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? So it seems as if some of these false teachers who are against Paul were actually putting out the lie mm. that actually Paul has changed his mind now Maybe because he circumcised Timothy. I think it's probably in reference to Timothy. They will yeah. know about it, and they're just spinning it. Yeah. That's That's it. Oh, Paul believes yeah. in circumcision. Yeah. Didn't, exactly. you, didn't you hear? That's Paul right. changed his yeah, mind exactly. on this. Yeah. You know, exactly. he yeah. Paul's on our side. Kind and of. there may be others like Timothy whom we, who we, we're not told about. Mm. But it's, it's quite possible. Yeah. Uh, but can I make an observation? We are absolutely rattling through our, our six or seven verses, uh, which is different. <laughs> Because <laughs> normally, we, you know, they, we, we could, we could one do a sentence, whole Bible one study on, on one verse. Yeah. But, um, but it, there is, it's like a whole passage as a, it is, as it, a block it, that it we're is. working on here. Yeah. 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 We've just passed half the halfway mark, just so you know, That's in terms right. of uh, moderating. We'll manage. Oh, oh good. Yeah. Yeah. One with the other. Yeah. <laughs> but, so, uh, yeah. yeah, it's. Um, his argument against that is, you know, if I really have done that, why do I suffer persecution? Mm. Mm. Just um, going back to 10, John, you were saying about the responsibility of, you know, teaching. You know, the, the, uh, the false huge, teachers, there's going to be a penalty. And, and, and I, you know, if you, if you have a, in a teaching position, and indeed as we are here in a hugely mm. privileged position, influencing who knows how many people yeah. in totality, not just today yeah. as they're listening. Yeah. Um, we have to be so careful, and I've said many times over the years on Revelation television, one of my prayers for myself is, Lord, please don't let me hold my theology so tight that you can't change it. Mm -hmm. and my goodness me, he's changed it over the years, I must yeah. say. Uh, I think it's, you know, I'm making no shout for myself, but I think if you are teaching, you need to have that tender heart. Recognize that you might have got mm -hmm. some things wrong mm -hmm. and be willing to allow the Lord to put it right. I think it's yeah. so important. Don't become entrenched in, in especially in vagaries, <laughs> you know, stuff that uh, one huge, huge danger in Bible teaching, and I, this is not original, I, I heard R.C. Sproul say it, R.C. Sproul, um, is when we take the implicit and use it to contradict the explicit. Mm, and so when you, you know, that, that is so important. Mm. And, and, and whether, I don't want to get into a, a, a discussion about predestination, Calvinism or anything like that, but you know, we, we, we have talked about being um, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That is so explicit, explicit yeah. that when you come to a verse like, God desires that all men be saved, it's implicit, but mm. you can't use it to contradict an explicit. Yeah. So you have to be, I'm, I'm not making a theological point no. here, I'm talking about the dangers yeah. of hermeneutics or interpretation, yeah. mm. where you, you need to be very clear what, 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 you know, what, you're being, what script you're being led by. Is it explicit or is it implicit? And if it's implicit, what do the ex explicit verses mm. say? because you can get into terrible trouble. Or, and we have a huge responsibility, yeah. a huge yeah, responsibility. Or, or I was going to say worse, that you, you actually cut out chunks of the Bible that don't fit your, yes. your frame mm. yeah. of view. So you, you literally are distorting yeah. God's word. It says in the Psalms, I think, the sum of thy word is truth. How yes. wonderful. Yeah. You've got to take the whole word of God. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you're, if you're re and the danger for some preachers, particularly maybe more in the charismatic movement, is, is to come up with a new revelation. That yeah. Something that people have never heard before, you know, exactly. and that will really put you on the map. Yes. You, you know, well that, you know, maybe God will show you something, but um, it's unlikely that nobody's ever seen it before. Yeah. <laughs> but also, you know, be careful because yeah. that could be a deception out of your human pride 
Mm. You, you just take something and it sounds good to you mm. and you don't check with the rest of the Bible. Yeah. So to be a proper Bible teacher, you need to know your whole Bible and that, that right. takes time to big, develop. Yeah. Job, and uh, James 3.1, of course, is the classic verse, isn't it? Because he says, yeah. Uh, yeah, go for it. you know, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, yes. knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So if you're called to teach, obviously you should, but you, you, you're going to need some time to really prepare yourself yeah. in the Word of God. Don't be in a rush because bear in mind the fact that God will hold you accountable for mm. your teaching because you can really mess people's lives up mm. yeah. if you put out some serious false teaching. And you've got to be careful, you know, I, I remember when I sort of started, you know, as a teenager, I suppose, doing a little Bible study here or there, it was leaning very heavily on what other um, folk had said, and to the extent of plagiarising, <laughs> you know. Oh, we've all and, done it. Uh, but what a great danger. Rather than what, what we're doing, we often have other commentaries that we're referencing, mm. but we're not just reading out Mm -hmm. the commentary. We're, it's actually starting with the scriptures and there's a helpful insight here. There's yes. a, you know, it helps to, to illustrate you know, this passage if you, if you read this commentary, but we should never start with the commentaries. Mm -hmm. you know, as you yeah. say, you need to know God's word and that's yes. a massive, yes. massively humbling thing because none of us fully, you know, none of us are fathomed always, it completely. Um, moving, but there's a spiral process whereby you, you want to exposit each passage, yeah. but then you, in, you, you have to interpret every passage through the whole Bible. Yeah. Well, in practice, how do you do that? You, you have a systematic theology in your mind of some sort mm. uh, th through which you, you interpret that passage. Mm. But also, if, you're, if, if those two things clash, you, you have to correct your systematic theology. So there's yeah. an interplay between yeah. your overall perception of the Bible and, and as you study each passage, you've got to be willing, as John said, to, to, to correct your theology, yeah. refine it, um, sometimes overhaul it, <laughs> yeah. uh, because this is the ultimate mm. word. But mm. Scripture does interpret Scripture, and that's a good principle yeah. that the clearer passages uh, should be used to yeah. interpret the... The implicit that was, more that obscure was good, passages. Yes, yes, that was and good. So there are laws as to how you go about it. Yeah. But you, you are constantly refining. Um, but but the, 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 the importance of exegesis, what is the scripture saying rather than eisegesis, me imposing on the scripture right. my, my frame. Yes. That's the great danger. Yes. Mm. And of course, attitude of the heart again. You know, that's why it says this, there will be a penalty. For those, those who are throwing you into confusion, those who are kicking you, deliberately kicking you off your step, yes. you know, and diverting you from the truth, there's a big penalty. Now coming back to teachers again and what James said, and I think James probably had in mind what, I think it was Ezekiel said, was it Ezekiel that taught? Mm. I think it's Ezekiel. Um, uh, now, uh, um, <laughs> Martin Luther would say that J J James, James didn't really know the gospel at all. Yeah. I think he, uh, <laughs> he that, uh, that, that that wretched Jacobite he used to talk about. Um, but 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 uh, you know he it, perhaps which is Hebrew for James. Is, yes, it, yeah. it, it, he just has a turn of phrase which which yeah. is uh, and he's writing to his own people, of course, in in, in their own language. It does sometimes see d appear that. Uh, James doesn't really understand grace, and perhaps he didn't really understand it very well. We're all different. But coming back to our responsibilities as teachers, we, we might be wrong, but we try to be right, yeah. which I think is a very different thing from taking a false doctrine, knowing it's false, mm. um, and, and perpetrating it like these mm. Judaizers were. I, I, did they know it was false? Yes, they must have done. They were just flying yeah. in the face of this yeah. revelation of who the Messiah was. But I think they were deceived themselves. Yes. Yeah, I think but so. They, that, were, they are accountable because they are. Their motivation, I think, was pride. Was yes. Self. Yes. Self promotion. And yeah, that's right. Self. That's that. Yeah, that's really the point I'm making is that they were deceived, um, and we're all deceived to some degree. But mm. it's and a great it's such danger. a willful deception. I yeah. that's the, what I want to pay. This the Judaizers. It's such a willful deception. They have stood firm against the truth of the Messiah. Mm. 
which is rather different from a teacher misunderstanding or reinterpreting a doctrine and leading people astray. It's not so, uh, so much a salvation issue. Yeah. This is a salvation yeah. issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. so that's very, very yeah, there, there are different levels. Yeah. There right. are, when people are preaching a false gospel, that is particularly so. Yeah. And, and Paul says at the start, doesn't he, let, let them be accursed. Yeah. So, so as a general rule, very bad to follow an individual, unless it's Paul. You know, it's very bad, you know, especially in the modern age. So all these years later... It would be like later, Bereans. Check out the script. Check yeah, the script. See, these you know, things Even so. the great Martin Luther. Yeah. Keep looking down because that's where your book is of yeah. commentary. But he got it wrong. He got it know, wrong about Israel. About the Jews. About the Jews, yeah. he got it wrong. Um, yeah. But great, you know, Grace, one... Grace oh, covered ref him. Reformation by, you know, sorry. Yeah. Justification by faith. Wonderful revelation. Yeah. I mean, people are going to have their favourite preachers, no yeah. doubt. But um, we shouldn't idolise anyone. That's right. Like, they, they mustn't, they, I, I don't even question what they say because yeah. They, yeah. They, they are so yeah. That's right. almighty. Elevated, yeah. We, no, we mustn't do that. Mm. Um, now, on the odd occasion, Paul clashed with Peter. I, yes. I, I tend to come down on Paul's side, but, you know, it, it, yeah. It, but, yeah, n not perfect. You know, the way he, he dealt with... Um, with John Mark, you know, yeah. he, wasn't, he wasn't a perfect man. But on these essential elements of doctrine, go, don't get confused. Yes. You know. uh, it's hard to fault Paul. Yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm absolutely um, totally thrown, by, uh, taken by him. Um, so, uh, sorry, I basically interrupted because I can see we are bounding towards verse 12. So you got to verse 11, yeah. Derek. Sorry. Yes, I was hoping that we'd make it to 12 at least. I'm sure we so. will because you've got over 10 minutes left. Okay. Well, anyway, his argument is basically, you know, why if, if I did preach circumcision, if I have actually converted as they're claiming and I'm preaching the law now, um, why am I still being persecuted wherever I go? Because literally every town Paul went, yeah. you know, the, 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 the Jews, the, the, how can I say, the Pharisees yeah. were, were out to yeah. stir up trouble against him. Yeah. And he says, well, if I've actually come to agree with their message, how come, you know, um, I'm still being persecuted wherever That's I go? It. So he brushes off that, that lie, that obvious lie. Yeah. And, and then he points out the source of persecution. Why are people so upset, you know, by this message of grace? Mm. And he says, the offense of the cross will have ceased. So what he's saying is that the message of the cross is an offense. A, the word is scandalon. It's an offense. And 1 Corinthians one twenty three mm. talks about the offense yes, of very the much. cross. Yeah. Why is it offensive? It's offensive to human pride. Mm -hmm. Because it tells me I have nothing good to contribute. In fact, all my so-called righteousness is was just deserving of crucifixion. Yeah, you know, and so it's very humbling. That's right. To say I've got no goodness in myself. That, that all I can do is throw myself at the mercy. And of, he says in that Christ passage, that no cross. one can boast. And no one can you boast. Know. So some people, that creates an offence for some people who That's want right. to justify themselves. They want to feel like, you know, it's flattering to say, you know, you can uh, earn your salvation, you're, you're, you're a good person. Yep. And, um, and so for the, until you've got the revelation, the cross is offensive. Can and we read it? Can we just read that, you know, take mm, a step out of, of Galatians, go into 1 Corinthians um, 1. Um, where he talks about it being a stumbling block. So, um, verse 23. Yeah, ver we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles. Um, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then later down, he said, he chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things. In other words, um, so that no one, verse 29, can boast before him. Mm. Again, you're right. People who want to justify themselves want to boast. Particularly for, the, for these Jews. The cross completely throws them. Yeah. Particularly yeah. for the Jews, because their whole life was keeping the law. Yeah. You know, that was, that's what gave them partly a feeling of righteousness, of superiority, of, you know, and, and, and now suddenly they're being told <laughs> yeah. all of that is, is as dung. You know, mm. is, 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 you can't 
doesn't help your salvation at all. That, that's a hard pill to take for, mm. the, for a really self-righteous person. Mm. And Paul was saying, Paul, the Pharisee as it were, the mm. Pharisee, you know, he was saying, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Yeah. He'd come right the way through it and he could see it from the other side as it were. Yes, calling on the words of Jeremiah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You boast, and it goes in the Lord. deep into human nature, doesn't yes. it? Yes. This, this need to, to think that I'm something and I can but once you've got it earn myself once that the yeah. switch is thrown you couldn't boast anything else could you it's, yeah. it's just it's wonderful yeah the contrast but mm. um, the Lord will continue to fight he, you know the when you, you you look at that you know the good shepherd and and how he just he knows the flock go astray and you only got to see sheep you know that wonderful program on television the Yorkshire farm thing. I, I don't know if you watch it, I expect lots of you to. Mm. Marvellous, this family with 10 children or whatever, farming the North Yorkshire Moors. And, you know, they go out to get the sheep and they take their four by, you know, the thing, whatever, you forget what you call them, power bike things, you know, four wheels. And off they go. But the sheep go in all directions. Yes. But they still round them up and bring them all home. And they mm. put themselves out to do it. They don't the old blow that one, we'll just <laughs> leave that one out there. Yeah. Put themselves out. Now, if that's what they do, how much more does the Lord do it for him? So, yeah, we, we are recalcitrant, you know, we are rebellious, we are independent. We're all these things in the flesh. And, and yet grace chases after us. And, mm puts his hook around our neck and brings us safely We're home We're completely again. lost. We're completely aimless. Completely lost. We're just full of folly, yeah. you know, chasing in every direction. Well, yeah, and half the time we speak a load of rubbish, you know, and, and yet he, <laughs> we're, we're here. Yeah. And uh, we're, exactly. it's going to be amazing studying these scriptures in eternity. Yeah. When, when, when the scales have really fallen from our eyes and we'll mm. see what our Heavenly Father has done for us. Yeah, he just keeps hammering, you know, these false teachers, doesn't he? Now, you, but, you know, you verse after verse this is after the punch, verse. The punchline, huh? Yeah. Verse 12. I wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. And that's a polite translation, of course. Yes. Yeah, mine says emasculate. Yeah, yeah it, that's right. It, Utilate it, themselves I or, think so. uh, what's the word, uh, castrate. Yeah. 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 That's what he's really saying. Yeah, I know. Um, make the, make themselves eunuchs, and yeah. that seems quite, t you know, he quite strong. Yeah, <laughs> it is. He's um, one 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 interpretation of that is well, in a way, he's he's saying, look, if if they if they are in so much into circumcision, you know, which is which is cutting, yeah. you know, and they there's they a play the on words earlier. I forgot to mention yeah. that, you know, if you cut your flesh, you are cutting yourself off from Christ. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, but also, right. if they're gonna, if they're so into this cutting, why don't yeah. they just go ahead and, and castrate cut their themselves? Lead yeah. Off. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> emasculate. I suppose that's yeah. the root of the word emasculate. Yeah. Don't know. But, but also, yeah. he could be saying as well because if they do that, they can't reproduce. Mm. You know, they can't oh, that's have a good children. That's a good, that's a good thought, yeah. So that's yeah. interesting, isn't it? They can't. Re they can't have children. So, in a sense, he's saying, "I wish they would." You know, stop he reproducing sees this sterile, false yes. Yeah, exactly. That they yeah. shouldn't have children and they shouldn't have spiritual children. Yeah. Because yeah. They, they are destroying people's lives. Mm. And therefore, if, you, if you're concerned for the sheep, although it seems harsh, if you're concerned for the sheep and there's a wolf trying to, you know, destroy the sheep, yeah. then it's, it's not wrong to, to be that strong. Yeah. And so I wish they, they, they would leave town. You know, I don't want them. So he's made his you. point, Derek and John, um, and we've got to verse 12. We've got five minutes left. What, what sh how shall we um, summarize where we're at at this point in chapter five? Well, uh, we, we're really talking about legalism here and, and legalism in its ultimate expression in the form of firstly circumcision and then sitting under the law, the law of Moses, which will do nothing. But Legalism in so many ways infiltrates religion and infiltrates Christianity, which is the mm. thing we're really interested in. Um, and you know, the Reformation has burnt itself out, there's no doubt about it. it, it it's still alive and active as much as we're, we're mm. talking about it and teaching and preaching yeah. it. But we, within the church at large, it has by itself, it, it essentially burnt yeah. itself out. Because, you know, take the Anglican church, it's 
which is one I know about, you know, it, I, they've essentially gone back under Rome, Romanism because they never cut themselves off properly in the first place. Mm. And you can see the seduction, the beautiful music and the yeah. pageantry, yeah. very, very seductive. So I, I you know, it, but, how, but how do you bring that through into a the free sacraments. church? It's difficult, yeah. you know, but we've taken the Lord's table and put it back in an altar. There are no altars in the yeah. New Testament, yeah. Yeah. not under the New Covenant. Yeah. They're not altars. We have the Lord's table, but no, you know, we, it's and, and standing before it and bowing yeah, down to it. And the laity. All the other thing, the bells and whistles and the smoke. And, Some do. And, That's and, the and sort of turning around to face the Bible as the gospel is read. I tell you, I cringe. Perhaps I'm wrong. I don't know. But I just cringe. I think this isn't freedom. But many of those this churches is, yeah, are is, running out of congregants. They are. So you're right. Maybe that there's something quite serious there. But even the sort of evangelical Anglicans still have the same format, don't they? But yes, they, they don't have the smells and the bells. But no, um, they do. But a lot, do them don't wear, a lot of them don't wear vestments now, do they? Not, or at least not all the time. That's right. And, and uh, um, they, they, yeah, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Yes. That, that the um, Reformation has burnt itself out. That's quite something yeah. to reflect on. Yeah. I think that. The point, the general point, is important because we've studying circumcision law of Moses. Of course, the issue in that form is not the issue today, today generally no. speaking. But by studying as it w the problem as it was then, hopefully we can recognise legalism mm. when it may come in different clothes. Mm. But it, by, it is helpful to study what it was because then hopefully we are now prepared to recognize it in different clothes yeah. um, and, and, it, and it can come in all kinds of different garbs. Yeah I agree because I, I, when you say it's burnt itself out and you obviously use the example of Anglicanism which is in decline, I mean statistically in decline, yet it's very active in doing good works more than ever. Yes. You know it's moved away from the pulpit into into the, the social other gospel. social gospel. Yeah. So it's quite interesting, isn't yes. it? But that is good works, and that's yes. sort of, which it's isn't good. a bad thing. No, it's but, not. But, but, but if but it is, if it's replacing the gospel. Which is what has happened, because they don't, generally speaking, preach the gospel. They practice the social gospel, which is fine, but that should come out of the preaching of the gospel, mm. not replace it. Mm. Um, so it's, we're quite in quite a precarious position, aren't we? Yes. So-called Western Christendom. Hugely so. so. Certainly all the established churches, because they, they are not only um, not preaching the gospel, they are preaching another gospel. And I mean, it's not just social gospel. They are, they are promoting through their synods and through their conferences a completely anti-biblical perspectives. They're promoting them. Yes. Uh, because it's political, it's politically correct, it's trying to fit in with the the tide of culture and so in that regard as well. But, isn't but I think it, they're trying to do it, it, it in the context of all of our studies yeah. uh, to, to, to do good. Yes. It's not as though they're not, they're not malevolent, they actually believe that it's, yes. it is good works that they're promoting. Yes, but it, of course it isn't good works that saves anybody, you know, it's the power of the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Yeah. But isn't it interesting that actually the more they practice the social gospel and the less they preach the true gospel, the greater the derision in which they're held by the public at large. It is sad, as much as they try to fit in, mm. they, yeah. they can't fit in. Um, so that's that's the danger of assimilation, yeah. isn't it? You don't, you know, you never. Whereas a church it. preaching the gospel might make them feel uncomfortable, but it generally doesn't. They don't hold you in derision. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Well done, everyone. Um, I've enjoyed, really enjoyed, uh, as we got to verse um, verse thirteen. Um, yeah, I've got ringing in my ear now. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Yes, amen. it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. This is uh, there in Romans one, and you know me, I can't get away from Romans. <laughs> but um, no, we are all not ashamed of the gospel, and we'll cover this more next week. Thank you, thank you.